And Gordon Gam is going to introduce today's speaker. In addition to the credentials that you see here, when David Skaggs was a co in Congress, he was the voice of civility. He was co-chair of the House uh, bipartisan retreat designed to encourage civility and comedy in the House. We could sure use some of that today. He had a strong environmental record while in Congress sponsoring the Colorado Wilderness Act, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's David Skaggs Research Center in Boulder, Colorado, for which he, he secured funding, is named in his honor. Skaggs co-sponsored the Energy Act of 1992 that amended utility laws to increase clean energy use. He was a co-sponsor of the American with Disabilities Act of 1990, outlawing discrimination based on disability. He leads the team in, federal lawsuit, in a federal lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of Colorado's Taxpayer Bill of Rights, TABOR, for violating the constitutional guarantee to each state of a Republican form of government by removing fiscal powers from the legislature and providing for their exercise only for plebiscite. However, I am most impressed by his inspiration to young people in using his legal education for a lifelong dedication to public service. His careers have been exemplary in applying the law to providing the instruments for a just society in service of the general welfare. I was inspired by my father to become a lawyer in service of disadvantaged people in our society who need lawyers to protect them from discrimination and from business people who take advantage of their lack of education and vulnerability because of their lack of power. Countries in which trust of the people in government were uh, where parents encourage their children to, to engage in public service report a higher quality of life than cultures where stature is obtained by wealth accumulation and power. David will speak today with us about the importance of political engagement in order to be uh, informed citizens capable of the duties of collective conscience of we the people to govern ourselves in service of the general welfare. So with that, Thank you very much, Gordon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I uh, saw that video the other day online and found it so inspiring, I asked if we could show it today. I hoped it would follow my remarks so that I wouldn't be upstaging myself. But um, I, I hope uh, you were as moved by it as I have been. And, <clears throat> and noticed that the middle verse was in Ukraine. So uh, it, it was reformatted to be shared with the brave people of Ukraine. Anyway, thanks very much for the opportunity to be with you again and share a few thoughts. Um, it's been a, a couple of years, three years, four years, five years, anyway, long enough for you to have forgotten what I did the last time I was here and, and be willing to invite me again. Um, as a recovering politician, um, to the question posed by the title of my talk, can we afford to grow tired of politics? Of course, I answer with a resounding no. Uh, but these days, that truth is far from self-evident. The context for that question, however, uh, is self-evident. That is, we are all tired, and so the need for some elixir. Uh, the foundation of our democracy, usually thought to be pretty solid, after January 6th of last year now seems to be a little fragile. It's been said in various ways, but I will put it this way. Politics, democracy, is the alternative to violence. I confess that I am a democracy nerd. Um, I've had the good luck to enjoy some success in politics over the years. In the process, my sense of how special 
democracy is has only grown. That sense is the product of experiences, and I hope you'll indulge me a little bit in sharing some of those which have been particularly important for me. I'll start with my time in the Marine Corps in the late 60s and early 70s. There, thrown together with guys from all over the country, I learned firsthand about the wonderful diversity of the American people. I also learned about the horrors of war in Vietnam. I learned about how loyalty enables a group of men to function under extraordinary stress. And hopefully I absorbed a few lessons in leadership along the way. After moving to Boulder in 1971, it seems just like yesterday, um, I joined the Democratic Party and soon became deeply involved in Tim Worth's race for the U.S. House back in 1974. Unlikely as it was in then Republican 2nd Congressional District, Tim won, thanks to o Watergate. And he asked me to go and head his office in Washington. That was an amazing experience an object lesson in the way it's all supposed to work. Tim and other newly elected Democratic members of Congress arrived at the Capitol eager to reform the place. They succeeded in undoing the strict seniority system and ending the lock on power in the House held by conservative Southern Democrats. They were Southern Democrats in those days. Southern Democratic Committee chairman. From Tim's start at 5% in the polls in early 1974, to his success in November, to joining others to make a dramatic change in the power structure of the House, all in under a year, I was hooked. After managing his 1976 re-election campaign, where I learned a lot more about the mechanics of campaigns, I left the Worth staff it was time for a vacation after more than two years of solid efforts, and I made my first trip to Europe. I grew up, as did a few other of the older guys here and women, I grew up in the post-war years imbued with the patriotism of the day. I'd been stunned by what I learned as a boy from the photos in Life magazine about the inhumanity of the Nazis. And I wanted also to see for myself the grimness of the communist East. On that trip and on my way to visit the Auschwitz camp in Poland, I spent a couple of days in Prague. This is 1977, and communist East Europe was still under the control of the Soviets. It hadn't been long since their crackdown on the Czechs in 1968. Anyway, I was a tourist walking around the old castle grounds in Prague, and a distinguished looking man came up to me and asked if I wanted to change money. Illegal and dangerous at the time, outside of the approved state system, so I said no. But there was something intriguing about this man, a, a nice, if frayed tweed jacket and tie, speaking pretty good English. I supposed he might be a professor, having come from Boulder, so I engaged him in conversation. This was soon after Jimmy Carter had been elected president and elevated human rights to a central tenet of our foreign policy. And I wondered if this man happened to know about that and, and what he thought. But he turned the question back on me. He told me, quote, remember your presidents, Washington and Jefferson. And he continued, Remember especially what your President Lincoln said at that battlefield in the Civil War. I was overcome. Uh, he noticed my emotion and turned away and disappeared into the crowd. But I wanted to talk more. I couldn't find him. So here was a kind of angel of American democracy in communist Prague. Who, who would have imagined? In the years that followed, I enjoyed good luck in politics, a successful run for the State House of Representatives in 1980, election to the U.S. House in 86, when Tim left the House for Gary Hart's Senate seat. But on to 1990, 13 years after that memorable encounter in Prague, and the world had changed. The Soviet Union was falling apart, 
and the Berlin Wall had come down, something we could never have imagined in the time before that. Laura and I, my wife and I, were part of a congressional delegation sent to observe the first free elections in East Germany since the Nazis had come to power in 1933. On the morning of election day, March 18th of 1990, we were posted and visited a polling place in a little village southeast of Berlin. An elderly couple arrived on bicycles to vote. After casting their ballots, they were told that there were some Americans here uh, to observe. They came over to meet us with tears in their eyes. They wanted to thank us for the hope that America had given them and that had sustained them for this day, 57 years since they had last voted in a free election. We could not have been more moved nor more proud to represent this country. In both the Colorado and the US House, I was trained that compromise was necessary in the work of a legislature. That's especially necessary when you're in the minority, as I was in the Colorado House and after the 94 election in the US Congress. I tried to turn that necessity into virtue, as I believe James Madison intended. Madison advised that a representative democracy, a republic in his terms, was needed in order to have a larger view of society and, and of ourselves. It is our representative bodies that are designed to work out our differences, to obtain majority support among representatives necessarily requires some give and take, some accommodation of others' interests. It demands compromise. Compromise so that we may fashion policies that can properly and peacefully accommodate our differences and diversity. We recognize that there are important things a society has to undertake as a whole, beyond what individuals alone can, can accomplish, things that depend on compromise. So compromise is not a dirty word. It is the business of legislatures, whether it's city council, the state legislature, or Congress. That impetus to compromise is especially important these days as we struggle again to give respect to those in America whose needs and aspirations have been too long and too easily neglected by the majority of us. We hold up democracy as a political system grounded in fundamental respect for the worth and dignity of all individuals, practiced through a government deriving its legitimacy from the people. So amazingly, we entrust our fate to our fellow citizens. To be expressed, we hope, through the reasonable compromises of our representatives. This is far from a risk-free proposition. It is grounded in an optimistic belief in the general goodwill of people, while protected by basic guarantees against their bad behavior. The currency of compromise is trust. Trust depends on knowing your political adversaries well enough to trust them. And that depends on spending time together. The pandemic has aggravated the personal distancing between Republicans and Democrats that was already all too prevalent. Distance is bad for democratic politics, whether among legislators or among citizens. We need to spend time together, getting to know each other and listening to each other. For this Earth Day, we might also recognize that democracies seem to pay better attention to the environment. Leaders can be too easily isolated. No doubt the sensibilities of the people in a democracy and their appreciation for the frailties of nature have a better route to informing our government. It is impossible to talk about democracy in April 2022 without talking about Ukraine. We face another impossible challenge to decency and freedom in Putin's war against Ukraine. I wish we could do more to help. 
We need inspiration, and Ukraine has inspired us. As war rages in Ukraine, it reminds us that politics is the alternative to violence in managing our differences. A similar lesson from January 6th of last year. Well, <clears throat> while we are not gathered on a literal battlefield as Lincoln was at Gettysburg and as Zelensky is in Kyiv, but that does not mean that we are not embattled. We cannot shrink from the battle that looms for the soul of the country. The outcome of that battle depends on the quality of our politicians. I am a Marine and a politician, but I am prouder to be a politician. Whether for peace or for the earth, we can't afford to be tired. We have no choice but politics. I love my country. I weep for its failings. I rejoice in its successes. I pray for its future. Thank you. I hope I haven't left enough time for questions. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions? Great. Hi. Um, I have a question uh, about uh, the use of reconciliation. Uh, since both parties, Republicans and Democrats, um, are passing their agenda through this process rather than working with each other in the spirit of compromise. And, so it seems like they don't need to, and I wanted to see what you thought about it. You know, isn't reconciliation an ironic term for that process, uh, since it typically happens when things are not well reconciled, but it's the, uh, it's the gimmick, if you will, under the Budget Act for dealing with things that have significant physical dimension to them without being subject to the uh, filibuster in the Senate. So that's, that's why it is the course taken. I. Uh, a couple of things. One, I, I wish that uh, my party and the leaders of my party in Congress and the President had not tried to jam as much into the reconciliation process as they did. Uh, should have anticipated that it was not going to go down well, particularly with Senator Manchin. Uh, and you are right, it, it obviates uh, the necessity for compromise, which otherwise ought to prevail. That said, it is also important in the sort of grand architecture of the budget process for there to be a way to get that job done expeditiously. Uh, rarely has the Congress done that job expeditiously for the last many years, but it's, that was the underlying rationale for reconciliation. Uh, early in a congressional session to, to have a mechanism to reconcile demands on the budget, taxes and spending, and and set the course for the rest of the legislative session. Uh, so apologies for its misuse, but uh, there is a rationale for it being there. Fantastic. We have a question coming uh, from John Kotke online. D David, it's John Kotke uh, from Florida. I'm down here with grandchildren, and it's just wonderful to see you again. Um, and as always, I'm inspired by your words. I, I wish you would share with us your thought on the role of money in politics and how that affects whether or not we really have a democracy. John, it's good to see you, even in the distorted perspective of seeing you on the screen here, but um, sorry you're not here in person. Ah, money in politics, the bane of um, our political life in so many ways. Uh, Happily, I got through my time in office before that became as uh, overwhelming a factor as it now is. Let me jump to uh, the conclusion, if you will. What do we do about it? Because it is certainly pernicious. Uh, two things. One, I reluctantly believe we will need at some point uh, to support an amendment to the Constitution that gets around the, the Citizens United decision of the Supreme Court, which is among other things, open the floodgates of money in politics. Uh, we could do things before having to deal with that constitutional amendment, better disclosure, uh, better limits, but uh, ultimately to really get at this in the rigorous way it needs to be gotten at, I think 
we will need to have the constitutional space for the Congress to do what it needs to do in regulating money and politics. Having conceded that, uh, let me throw out an unlikely and uh, so far unused remedy that exists without a constitutional amendment. Uh, both the House and the Senate under the Constitution have plenary authority to make rules for their operations. Tomorrow, well, they won't be there tomorrow. Next week, the House of Representatives could pass a change to the rules of the House that would impose some greater limits on the uh, ability of members of the House to be seated depending on how th they financed their campaigns. It's, it's obviously a somewhat awkward workaround, but that power is there to be used. Same for the Senate. So uh, what could, I think, be done quickly uh, with, if, if only there could be a secret vote, would be to put out of business the so-called leadership PACs that most members of the House and Senate have, ostensibly to raise money for their hoped-for race to have a leadership job, but really just an excuse to raise even more money to distribute for one reason or another to serve their political purposes. Uh, it, 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 along with regular campaign finance fundraising, means that members spend enormous amounts of time on that rather than on the business that they were hired to do by all of us, which is to become as expert in complicated policy questions as we wish that they would be. So those are thoughts on the, the money in, in politics. It's, it, I think eventually there will be yet another scandal of the size of Watergate uh, that will finally prompt the Congress to, to do what needs to be done on this, whether it's the rules change that I'm suggesting or going ahead and sending an amendment to the country for the state legislatures to adopt that would empower Congress to really address this issue. We have a lot of questions coming in. Hi, thank you for being here. As a self-professed democracy nerd, do you have, do you have an opinion kind of on the relative benefits of a two-party system and a multi-party system like other countries experience? And do you think that those differences might exasperate or um, s resolve some of the issues around the division we have today? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the intrigue of, of, of multiple parties, I mean, we already have them, it's just that they don't amount to a heck of a lot. Uh, my first run for Congress, I, I won with under 50% of the vote because some of the vote had been siphoned off by some of the third parties, even in 1986. Uh, you know, it, it is so fully baked into our system that um, I, th I think discussing it is about as theoretical as wondering what it would be like if we didn't have the Senate. You know, it's not gonna go away, I believe, in, at least in my lifetime. Uh, what is maybe underlying the question is can't we find a way of having a political system that is more receptive to other points of view and doesn't get people locked out if they're not willing to play the Republican or Democrat game. And there are things percolating around, including here in Colorado, that I think are useful examples of what can be done. Here, as you probably have read or noticed, um, we will no longer be excluding uh, independents or anybody else from voting in either party's primary. So you can have a say in who gets nominated, either by the Democrats or by the Republicans. The underlying hope, anyway, in that change which we adopted uh, back, I guess, in the 2000 uh, election cycle, uh, 2020, I should say, uh, was that, that this would um, introduce moderating influences and, and push what had been the extremes of the party's predilections toward the center. Um, an another reform that, um, I forget, are we doing this in Boulder next, uh, is rank order voting. Uh, Maine has that. Um, I think Alaska has that. I don't, are you anybody familiar with rank order? Oh, yeah, good. So it, it, it basically says if nobody gets a majority in the general election and you have, you know, three or four different candidates on the ballot, uh, the low vote getters' votes get redistributed uh, according to that candidate's voters' second choice. 
Anyway, again, another way of trying to uh, induce candidates not just to play to their party base, but to play to other independent voters. Uh, California has its own, I hate to suggest that California is a model, but anyway, California has its new system still sort of in test drive, although it's been around for a few years now, which is the top two vote getters, regardless of party, go on the general election ballot. So in a heavy Republican or Democratic district, uh, while the, the, the two people coming out of the primary may both, both be of the same party, they then go on the general election ballot and are necessarily um, trying to appeal to voters beyond the party base in the general election, again, hoping to get things moderated a bit. Oh, we have another question right here. <clears throat> uh, David, I want to thank you. and. Uh, I want to tell you I voted for you. I've been around for a long time, and I've, <laughs> I've never doubted that vote. But I also shared um, the belief that you have in the superiority of uh, our American constitutional system. I, I mean, I know all the faults and what have you. But it wasn't until Bill Barr was appointed <laughs> that, that seriously, it, almost like a, some kind of conversion experience, I now really do uh, fear the possibility that, that Trump will come back and, and it, it'll get even worse than it is now. You mentioned that you had prayers. Can you give me any, can you give me any hope that you, from things that you see on horizon that this horrific uh, period is going to come to an end so I can believe in America again? Well, thanks for the easy question. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't have any alternative um, but hope because I can't live with despair. Uh, and, you know, it, it reminds me a little bit about, you know, all of the debates which are still quite pertinent about the future of the Social Security Trust Fund. Uh, you know, we're drawing it down faster than we're adding to it and someday it's all going to run out and then what? Um, we're not going to let that happen, and I, don't, I wish Congress had addressed that better sooner, but it's going to get addressed. Uh, on this more vexing assessment of the state of sort of the American populace, um, a couple of things. One, there, there is and needs to be a, a, a growing effort to deal with civic education in the K through 12 classrooms of the country. That, that's where we used to learn about our own system of government and uh, be either persuaded or inculcated or whatever with uh, the respect for our institutions that now have has sort of gone um, in the ditch. So, but let me get to sort of a more concrete set of concerns that I have about 2024 and what might happen. Uh, and that has to do with what is uh, referred to as the independent legislature theory uh, under Article I of the Constitution. And I don't know whether you all have heard that phrase. It's sort of getting more currency these years. It was particularly propounded by um, uh, John Eastman, our erstwhile lecturer in conservative thought at the University of Colorado, who's really gone off the, the deep end and into the dark side, in my opinion, trying to develop this uh, uh, theory for Trump to have used and to use the next time. Anyway, the theory is that uh, under Article I, state legislatures have their own uh, unreviewable authority to deal with the selection of presidential electors in disregard, if they feel like it, in disregard for the popular vote in their states. So this, this is uh, a, a really dangerous uh, approach to dealing with uh, our presidential politics, one that I hope the state legislatures in Arizona or Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania will make short shrift of, but it's it is gaining some traction out there and one that we 
need to particularly be aware of and, and put to one side. Because, you know, the idea that somehow the Colorado legislature, if they didn't like what happened in the popular vote, could just put that aside and say, we're going to name our own electors for president and the voters be damned. But that's what's in play out there. Gordon. We have Hi. another question online um, from Merrill. Yes, David, thanks for speaking to our club. We've had, uh, you and I have had a few good conversations at events. The most recent was Sustainable Israeli Palestinian Projects, a wonderful nonprofit in Boulder. But uh, here's my question. Um, I, I'm as similar to John, I have a concern, but this, my concern is also not just money, but also social media and its effect on our elections uh, for bad and maybe for good. Um, is there any hope of social media playing a more positive and less negative role, especially with the exponential spread of disinformation and foreign infer inference in our elections? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I spent the first few days of this week uh, on a, something called Congress to Campus, a program by the former members of Congress Association to send bipartisan members, former members to college campuses. It happened to be convenient. I was down at the Auraria campus talking to classes and young people from, and not so young people, uh, at CCD and UC Denver and, and Metro State. Uh, and I was taken to school by those young people about how significant they see social media as having a, a, a really evil impact on their lives in general and on their sense of politics in particular. And the question came up during our conversations down there. I was there with um, Mike Bishop, a former congressman from Michigan. Uh, how do you deal with that? Um, it looks like the Congress, through hearings and otherwise, is trying to at least shame the large um, internet platforms into doing a better job of policing themselves. Given the First Amendment's protection against laws having to do with an incursion on free speech, I'm not sure that we can pass any laws that will make for better online behavior. But it, an interesting idea came up in discussions again at, at Metro with a, a, an IT guy that was a student, that it's the algorithms that are used by Facebook and Twitter and, and the platforms. It's the algorithms that really drive or can drive this um, uh, negative behavior and, and, and set of expectations. And, and that made me think, is there a way we could properly, even with the First Amendment, address the algorithms that are uh, at work in that system. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I just want to sort of acknowledge my own eyes being opened a little bit more than they had been about how pervasive all of this is in the lives, especially of folks under 40. David? Bill is going to rescue me. <laughs> no, you don't need rescuing, David. Um, David and I go back a long time. We were baby lawyers in this town 40 some years ago, and uh, he's gone on to a very illustrious career in public service, and we all thank him for that. But I particularly admire, David, your, your sense of civility and integrity and devotion to the institutional norms that uh, used to govern and hopefully someday will again govern our democracy. Uh, regardless of policy differences, those sorts of norms, integrity, civility, are what make dem democracy work. And you're a prime, prime example of the best of that. Um, as you know, from having been here before, Rotary is heavily involved in the campaign to end polio. And as we love to say, uh, we're this close. And uh, we are, again, this close after having backslid a bit. But in your honor, we will be do uh, donating 100 doses of the vaccine, polio vaccine, to Rotary's Polio Plus campaign. And hopefully next time you come, 
we can celebrate the fact that we've ended polio. Thank you again so much for coming and for what you've done. Thank you, Bill. Honored to have the donation.